This is Rick Matson from the University of Washington Shoulder and Elbow Service. Let's talk a little bit about x-raying the arthritic shoulder. We plan our shoulder joint replacements using just three plain x-rays. The first is shown on the left is an AP in the plane of the scapula, which shows the joint. We also take an AP of the humerus, which shows us the arm bone to make sure there are no surprises there. And then on the right, we have what we call the axillary truth view. So the first view is the AP in the plane of the scapula, sometimes known as the Grashy view. And that is taken by orienting the beam 30 degrees uh, internally to the plane of the body. And that actually puts it perpendicular to the plane of the scapula. So the cassette is put flat on the back of the shoulder blade and the beam perpendicular to it. We like to have, if possible, the forearm at 30 degrees angle with the uh, plane of the x-ray. And this is the kind of view we get, and it gives us a lot of detail about the arthritic anatomy. It also gives us an idea about the amount of medialization. We talk about the lateral acromial line, which is this red line, and we compare that to the lateral tuberosity line shown here. You can see that if the humerus is medially uh, migrated, it will show up as very little distance between these two lines. And often we try to restore that line with our shoulder joint replacement. The next x-ray we use is an AP of the humerus. And this needs to be taken far enough down the arm to cover the area where our prosthesis may sit to make sure there are no uh, unexpected surprises of shape of the arm or of prior hardware. And the third view is what we call the axillary truth view, which is taken uh, with the arm in abduction away from the side. And this shows the AP position of the humeral head in relation to the glenoid. And it's important that this be oriented properly so we can see the what we call the eye or the spinoglenoid notch as shown here. So here's a good example of a truth view. And here's the spinoglenoid notch. And we can see that the this particular glenoid is not retroverted and we can see that the humeral head is centered into it. And some people call this a type A2 glenoid because it's medially eroded but not posteriorly decentered. Again, when we take the, uh, the axillary x-ray with the arm in a standardized position of abduction, we get a chance to um, identify functional posterior decentering. So here with the arm up, as is shown here, it slides into this posterior concavity. And here on the CT scan, which is taken with the arm at the side, we don't get the same appreciation of that posterior decentering. We can measure the amount of posterior decentering easily by measuring the ratio of the distance from the front of the glenoid to the contact point. Uh, and dividing that by the distance between the front and the back of the entire glenoid. We also can see uh, on the axillary truth view the amount of posterior glenoid erosion. So here's our eye, and we can clearly see that there's a posterior bi uh, biconcavity. So let's look at a few views that show us this functional posterior decentering. So here again on the AP view, everything looks nicely centered, but on the truth view, we can see it's posteriorly decentered with a posterior point of contact. Here again, centered on the AP view when the arm is raised, it's posteriorly decentered. Centered on the AP view, posteriorly decentered on the truth view. Same here, centered on the AP, posteriorly decentered on the truth view. And finally, centered on the AP seriously posteriorly decentered on the truth view. The truth view can also show us uh, other things in addition to the posterior decentering. For example, here was a large posterior osteophyte that uh, made dislocation of the shoulder very difficult at surgery, but at least we have advanced notice <clears throat> of the uh, osteophyte in the back there. So we were prepared to deal with it. Um, you, as we mentioned, you can easily measure glenoid retroversion using the truth view. 
Uh, it's the angle between the body and the face of the glenoid. Taking that angle and subtracting it from 90 degrees gives us the amount of retroversion. So in other words, if the glenoid face was perpendicular to the plane of the scapular body, there would be no retroversion. If this angle is tipped back, as shown here, then the amount of retroversion is the amount of posterior tipping. Here's a severely retroverted uh, glenoid. Folks have said that you need to have a CT scan to accurately uh, measure glenoid version. We find that the measurements that we get on the axillary truth view gives us plenty of information to manage the, the patient without spending the extra thousand dollars on a CT scan and without subjecting the patient to 26 times the radiation than they would get from a standard uh, plain x-ray. So we think it's n more safe and more cost-saving um, for the patient to use a standardized axillary truth view rather than a CT scan. So here are uh, a little, here's a little sampling of axillary truth views, and you can see the detail of the glenohumeral pathoanatomy that we have um, across this spectrum. And um, you, know, you can see that there's just a huge amount of variation that really challenges glenoid typing. So is this a, a B1? Maybe it's a mild B1. Is this a B1 or a B2? Is this a, a B2 or a B1 or is this a, a B2? So to me, it's just easier to look at the axillary x-ray and you can pick up the amount of decentering, the amount of retroversion, and the amount of biconcavity. The point is that with quality views like this, do we need to spend the extra money and subject our patient to the additional radiation of a CT scan, or do we have all the information we need to do a good job of the shoulder arthroplasty? We believe that the axillary truth gives us everything we need to know. So again, in conclusion, just three x-rays to evaluate the arthritic shoulder, an AP in the plane of the scapula, a view of the humerus to look for deformities or hardware, and then the axillary truth view. Thank you.